Welcome everyone um, to this quasi cyber seminar series, Research and Observatory Catchments, Legacy in the Future. Um, quasi has been very excited about this series um, and the interest that it's garnered so far. Thank you all for joining us this week on week eight of this cyber seminar series. Um, the series was convened by Jamie Shanley, Stephen Sebastian, Julia Jones, and Teresa Blume. My name is Julia Masterman. I'm the Science Education and Outreach Coordinator with QUASI. QUASI is the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science Incorporated. And our mission is to advance water science by strengthening interdisciplinary collaboration, providing critical infrastructure through our data services, and promoting education in water science at all levels, in part through programs like this one. I would encourage you to reach out to me, visit our website, or sign up for our newsletter to learn more about what we do or to get involved. I'll put links to that effect in the chat in just a moment. Um, this series is being recorded and will be posted on the Quasi YouTube channel. Um, check out the previous seven weeks of this series on the um, YouTube channel if you haven't watched them already. This has been an incredible series with many, many, many speakers talking about many, many, many different topics. So um, there's a lot to learn and catch up on if you haven't seen it yet. But thank you for joining us this week. If you have any questions about the webinar, please put them in the chat. There'll be time for Q&A and discussion as we go through this panel. And we'll do our best to address as many questions as possible. And thank you again for joining this week. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts in the discussion. Hmm. This week, we will have a conclusion and synthesis um, week uh, where we'll hear from two panels, which will be introduced in just a moment. And with that, I'll pass it off to our conveners. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And thank you so much for all the uh, effort you've gone through to help make the series a success through the eight weeks. We really appreciate it. Um, so today we're going to have some cross-site thoughts and thinking. Uh, we thought that the biggest things on your mind would be how we can combine data for cross-site synthesis and how we can help each other with ideas on how to continue funding these catchments. So we put out that survey that you all got. And to me, the surprise was the biggest thing on your mind, those two things were high up on the list, but the biggest thing was how to keep this community spirit going. So that was pretty gratifying to us conveners. And uh, we'll start that conversation today, um, but it will certainly continue on in the weeks to come. Um, so we, throughout the series, we ask you for questions, you know, what can we, talk about in this last week. And we did get a lot of great questions from you all. In fact, it was so many that we had a hard time singling, singling out individual questions and decided just to convene these panels and give them the, the topics that sort of floated to the top. And you just see the topics here, but we, we put in some of the questions to help guide their thinking on some of these. But um, so we divided this into a early career panel and a more established career panel. And we decided to have the established career go first, just to sort of symbolize, you know, the handoff that, you know, it's this younger, the early career scientists who are ultimately going to lead the whole catchment science effort. So they're going to go first and I will introduce them now. Uh, I have to say that, you know, we gave the panels, these are topics and questions. And they did, they did their homework. They really have gotten uh, a lot of thoughts down and ready to present to you. But I don't think this is going to appear to be overly scripted. Um, there'll be a lot of ad lib and back and forth and chance for audience questions. So I will introduce the panel, but then hand it over to Steve to explain the questioning. And mention now that Julia Jones will give you a time of four minutes into each topic. So we approximately seven and a half minutes per topic. Each panel will have about a half an hour. So on our established career panel, starting off, we have Kevin Bishop from the uh, University of Agricultural Sciences in Sweden, Irina Creed from University of Saskatchewan, Peter Groffman at City University of New York and a longtime Harbor Brook researcher, Ilya von Meerfeld from University of Zurich and Ross Woods, University of Bristol. Okay, go for it, guys and girls, women. Actually, if I can oh. quickly interject. So we really yeah. are hoping that the audience participates. So as you're hearing the panelists respond to the questions, 
let us know what you're thinking. If we can work it into this discussion, we will. We're gonna try and take care of as many of your questions as we can. So please do use that chat feature. The panelists and the mod and us as conveners, we will see it. We will repost the questions to the extent that we can and we'll try to redirect and the, the questions if, if need be. So thank you very much for your participation. I should say, we're counting on questions from the audience. We're leaving time in our panel for that contribution, so. <laughs> All right, the, the first topic that we asked the, this first panel to address is with the community spirit that it, with the community spirit that's become evident from this whole process, how can we keep it going? So what are the forums for continued interaction? Some specific questions that we pose to them are, how do we preserve, sustain, and foster the community spirit in international catchment science? What tools could help us support this? How can we better share information with the community? Do we need a forum for international catchment synthesis? And finally, how or who would lead such an effort to create and manage such a forum? So with that, please take it. Unmute. <laughs> Ilya, would you like to start? Um, sure. Um, so I really think that we should try to keep this community spirit going and it would be very, very useful. And I also think that perhaps we have to think about different ways um, of, of doing this. So perhaps some creative ways to include uh, data um, sharing perhaps, um, but that's the second topic. Um, but also um, maybe tagging on to um, existing um, conferences, having special sessions on catchments and, and catchment science, um, and perhaps having creative sessions there uh, as well, where we talk about our catchments, draw our schemes of our catchments, uh, and then try to use those uh, types of information uh, to come up with new ways of interacting. but maybe other people have other uh, suggestions for more standardized forms, perhaps, Ross or Irina. Thanks, Celia. I, I absolutely agree that these conference sessions are vital. In fact, I once again want to congratulate those who have uh, conceived of the AGU special session and were de dedicated to seeing it year after year continue and which ultimately seeded this wonderful session. Uh, one, of the, one of the inputs given from members of the audience in forming the questions was, do we need a forum for international catchment synthesis? And of course, when you look at the beautiful map that uh, Stephen and others have helped create, it, it help, I can't help but think of something like the United Nations. And when I look at something of an international forum, I'm aware of UNESCO and they have a UNESCO chair program. And I imagined what about seeking a UNESCO chair that would help promote these international inter-university and inter-agency cooperation and networks that would focus in, on enhancing the work that we do. Not only would that elevate the profile of these small headwater to larger systems, but it would also be a mechanism to unite us on, on addressing some of the big challenges. So I'm thinking that it could serve as like a global think tank and as a bridge uh, towards science and policy actions, uh, as well as being a center of innovation that could help build north-south and east-west cooperation. So I know that's a bit outside the box, but I, I know of several people who have UNESCO chairs and I imagined that maybe in Switzerland, we can have a UNESCO chair in catchment sciences that could coordinate us and give us a, the profile that I think we, we have earned. What do you say, Ross? Yeah, I, I think that's great. If I, if I want to specifically address the question about forums, I think that one of the things that we might need is some digital forums that work for us because I think in the post-pandemic world, we're not going to be able to do everything as in-person meetings. And also I think we've recognized that there are opportunities to make 
our community more accessible by doing some things remote using remote participation. And in a couple of minutes, I'll talk about a couple of suggestions that I've got for things that we could do together, synthesis activities that really would benefit from a digital forum as well. I mean, I miss real people as much as anybody and would love to see you all again in person. But I think there's, there's some real value to digital forums. Those obviously don't run themselves. They still require real people to provide structure and events and cheerleading and focal points where we agree, let's do something by date X. But I think there's potential real benefit to getting large groups of people together in digital forums. You're about uh, five minutes into this topic. Great. I mean, digital forums, if when, when I saw this Kwasi, this idea of eight series, I thought I'm, I might last the first half of one of these. And here I am after eight sessions. I mean, just putting these, these catchments next to each other and hearing about them, it was great. Um, I was really impressed by what happens when we talk to each other. So I'm uh, inspired about the possibilities and uh, very glad we won't have to be running up our carbon footprints to keep these discussions going if we can make it work. Is there anybody out there? How's the panel? Any questions come in from the chat that we could take? Uh... Yeah, so Julia was asking about uh, the seminal paper that Lea, Luna Leopold wrote in the early 1970s, questioning the value of catchment sciences. And, um, you know, what relevance do they still have in this day and age? <laughs> I think Peter's going to lead off with that question when we get to number two, actually. He, he's got the provocative one about who do we think we are. So maybe we can wait on that one for the next question. <laughs> Perfect. Teresa, can you summarize any questions? Or are you seeing something that relates to this topic? Um, there was just now a question if the new hydrology, AGU hydrology meeting might be a good venue to also uh, have a focused discussion or session. So this new, newly to be established meeting. Um, mm -hmm. And then there was a, a comment that making a system for accessing and sharing data like what the flux towers have might be helpful. So this is a global initiative that works pretty well. Uh, you're at the seven and a half minute mark now. So okay. great. The, the second major topic that we asked this panel to address were was cross-site synthesis. Some of the specific questions we asked are what topics do you find most exciting for cross-site syntheses? What kind of syntheses are most desirable? Um, would they be conceptual? Would they be broad, broad but theme-based? Or would they be focused and narrow? And then how do we choose and organize around these synthesis topics and identify leaders for that? So how do we come together and move forward? Well, Stephen, I'll take a crack at starting the conversation on that one. And I'm inspired by um, the United States uh, National Science Foundation's 10 big ideas. One of the 10 big ideas that have been articulated is this idea of convergent research. And from what I understand, convergent research is where you start uh, the purpose of a collaboration with a provocative question, a challenging question, and then you foster collaborations needed to, for a successful inquiry to answering that question. And so in my thinking, um, you know, I know that uh, Peter Groffman, I think, said in one of the chats or in one of our personal emails, I can't remember which, about the need to be policy relevant. And so I started thinking about what kind of policy relevant challenging questions could we have and looking forward uh, over the next decade could we uh, come up as a community for a question for every year of the next for every year of the next decade and so one example could be something with that's really close to issues that we're facing all of us are facing is climate change and carbon and so I would one want to pose a challenging question about 
what, uh, what are the role of catchments as carbon sinks or sources and what would that have as implications for a carbon economy as an example. So the idea would be that we pose a provocative question and that all the network of catchments uh, can look at their own data and see how they can contribute to answering that question. So question driven approach. Hey, what do you say? I mentioned you uh, in terms of the policy action. Yeah, so um, so I, I um, the the question there's there's this question of uh, you know, we of, of of bridging the gap between science and society or science and policy, and that that's policymakers or or both the broad the broad the broader public and 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 I do work in urban systems where there's a lot of um, interest in engaging with um, the general public and with policymakers. And, and we had assumed, we knew, we didn't even question <clears throat> that the watershed approach was gonna be this great integrative uh, concept that was going to help us integrate. And in particular in urban systems, we were trying to integrate across um, biophysical and social sciences. Um, and we were trying to integrate between science and society uh, because we've been so successful in watersheds. I mean, it, watersheds bring hydrologists and microbiologists and plant ecologists and microbial ecologists together. It's been a really great integrative and it's really propelled progress in our disciplines. Um, it hasn't always worked super well um, when, when, we push, when we push beyond the integrations where we've been successful, right? So I work at Hubbard Brook. Um, we do a lot of work with, with birds, right? And insects. They don't recognize the watershed boundary. We even put blue tape up to mark the watershed boundaries and still the birds are ignoring the watershed boundaries, <laughs> much to our chagrin. Um, and, then, and then the other thing is, uh, is, is so with, policy, with some policymakers, watersheds really help. Uh, with the general public, um, we've been disappointed, right? So we do a survey. We call up about 2,000 people in the city of Baltimore um, every five years or so. We ask them questions about what do they know? What do they value? What are, you know, how are their knowledge and values influence, uh, affect their actions? And um, boy, nobody knows that they live in a watershed. We ask them a question. Um, a watershed is defined as an area of land that drains to a certain point. Do you live in a watershed? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and that's been a little disturbing for us um, because maybe it's not this great bridging concept um, that we had thought it was. And, and what's interesting, so we, we then added a question about ecosystems. An ecosystem is defined as all the biotic and abiotic, blah, 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 a piece of land. Do you live in an ecosystem? And, and, and so, so, so that was kind of interesting. And the other thing is we also then, we did this in six cities in the US, um, Boston, Baltimore, Miami, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Phoenix, and Los Angeles. And, um, and they did worse in Phoenix than they did in Baltimore, right? So in Baltimore, it's maybe 45% of the people thought they lived in a watershed in Phoenix, it was like 20%, which suggests that the, that the, that the question was actually was actually a reasonably ro robust question. So to me, um, this is just a, a super exciting challenge that we that we should think about. Um, it's been it's been really useful to us. Um, is is it going to be useful for some of, as we as we ex, as we expand the scope? And I also I just had to add one thing one thing from from the last question about how we keep this going. This this series has been just tremendous. It's like, like Kevin said, no, nah, I'm not going to sit through this whole thing, and here I am. You know, eight weeks later, still sitting in on, there's people from all over the world. Um, it only takes an hour or an hour 15. You know, it's, it's, it's I, I think the organizers I, I have worked very hard. I, I hope we can keep something like this going because it's a very rare and unique thing to be able to talk to such a, such a, such a broad audience. You've got about a, two minutes or a minute and a half left on this topic. Okay, I, I have an idea which fits quite well to Peter's suggestion that it is something relatively short that people can do uh, and, and get together and also comes back to the earlier question on how do we keep uh, momentum going and what can we do for watershed comparisons and there was this question on should we have a shared uh, sort of data frame where we can compare catchments. Um, I actually think one activity that we could do that is very concrete, it's creative, uh, and it doesn't require so much time would be to have an event where we all sort of sketch, for example, the dominant processes in our watershed and then sketch them and uh, make them blind copies, compare these blind sketches and uh, ask people to group them 
And I think that way we may come up with some uh, catchment comparisons and catchment groupings uh, that we wouldn't have expected earlier on, where we normally start comparing catchments based on climate or based on topography. Uh, we also keep it inclusive for people that may not have all the data that is required for these databases or have only short-term data. Um, and I think later on comparing our sort of mental grouping or physically actually with cards grouping these things uh, with some grouping based on, on real data, it would allow us for some intercatchment comparisons that haven't been tried yet uh, and would be inclusive, would be fun, and um, would also, in the way that you say, uh, relatively quick and easy compared to creating massive uh, global databases for comparisons. Great. This yep. is a message from the panel to the organizers. Let's go two minutes over on this question and cut us off a minute on the other two, because I know Ross has got something to say here too. We don't want to miss. Yeah, so I completely agree with Ilya that this idea of sharing our sketch of what the catchment looks like could be potentially a really valuable way of exchanging information. And so we could do this at physical events where we can sketch on pieces of paper and share them. And we could also do this digitally in a way where each of us can create this sort of sketch or perceptual model of a catchment. And then we can share those with one another and have the opportunity to discuss them and debate them and say, I think this place looks like this. And I think this place actually looks something different. And we try and think, how could we resolve that? Can those two views exist at the same time? And the alternative, can I find two sketches that belong to different places, but look quite similar? And what do I learn from that? Yes, exactly, Russ. Yeah, I think another useful thing that we could do that's slightly more at the technical end is I think it would be very useful if there could be some kind of community agreement on what we define as a metric for observed catchment response. So if you were to summarize your place with half a dozen numbers, what would they be? And so that might be something that describes the, the amount of water or how water's stored or how, how it moves or maybe it's a chemical descriptor, um, could be a bunch of things, but I think it would be really useful international currency to be able to exchange with one another if we would all talk about places with a similar set of descriptors. And this would be a way to then compare those descriptors. And if you see, why is, if you see these responses, you could ask questions like, why is my site's response similar to that one, but not to this one over here? What's actually going on there? Can I explain that? Great. Thank you very much. I think there's a lot of great comments and questions in the chat. I think we'll circle back to some of those as we move through the remaining questions in this panel and with the, the, the later second career, the uh, second stage of career panelists too. So I think we should move on with topic number three if the panelists think that we're wrapped up with that last point. Agreed? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, 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 set, the, the third topic area is with long-term considerations, um, meaning how do we keep ourselves going by maintaining funding? And then how do we consider legacy effects in the framework of the catchment studies? So what has happened before our time periods that may still have lingering effects in our catchment? So the specific questions that we pose to them are, what are successful strategies for sustaining long-term funding for catchment studies? including data management and releasing of those data to the public so that anyone can use them. How do we break the short-term funding cycle? How do we keep monitoring the right things? And how can legacy effects be conceptually included and, and addressed? Um, and that may also be relevant to some catchments that are relatively new and being established and only have several years of, of funding. So with that, panelists, please chime in. Kevin, maybe you can start. Oh, Peter, no, Peter is our, 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 our lead leader man. on this one. <laughs> so for, for, for a couple of years, uh, several of us at Hubbard Brook have been campaigning for a new program in the United States called Datasets of National Importance, based on the recognition that long-term data streams are essential for progress in science and society in many different disciplines. And so 
And so this would, and, and if we had a program that cut across disciplines, so this would be health studies. Like, so we have a famous long-term heart patient study in the US. We have a famous uh, study on our early childhood interventions in the US. We have uh, Cashman studies. We have uh, the, the carbon dioxide record at Mount Aloha. And, 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 if, and if we could, we could, we could um, and, and this could be done perhaps in an international coordinated way, but it basically would be endowing uh, some of these long-term data sets, it, it would be transformational in the power of, of science to, to contribute across many sectors of society. And since you, yeah, it's a sort of a pie in the sky, but it's a, you know, it's a discussion. So I just want to pick up from Peter's uh, comment about national funding. Uh, in Canada, under our pre previous prime minister, all funding was cut to one of our treasures, which was the Experimental Lakes area. And in fact, all the data and, and uh, articles were put into a, a, a garbage bin, if you could believe it. And so what happened was a foundation took over. And so I'm wondering uh, with it, the idea presented in the States, do you look for alternative revenue sources such as foundations and things uh, to support these these, what did you call them? These gems of data. And how could we on a global scale identify where they are so that we could contribute and, and help keep these ones alive? So what kind of criteria for identifying them and what kind of diverse funding mechanisms could be used to support them? Do you have any follow-up? I don't mean to be asking you a question, Peter, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> the, the model that I think about is the long-term research and environmental biology program at the National Science Foundation in the US. It's a competitive program. And you write a proposal, if you've got 10 years of data, um, then, they, then they, they program, it funds it in five and 10 year increments to, to keep it going. And so, so it's competitive and you have to have the data and you must agree to make the data publicly available. And if you don't have a clear plan for doing that, then, then you won't get funded. So I, I think, I think it's, it's an expansion almost of the LTRED program to more data streams, more funding. I, much as I, I uh, want to see that central funding for the gems, I've been impressed in this Kawashi series, how many catchments I'd never heard of and the local support some people have um, that may not go on for 50 years, but they're certainly feeling a need and they've got local funding. And I just want to, something that goes into our last question, if, if people can find good operating procedures, their, their data is archived, then it becomes a part of a global resource, which maybe in this, you know, in the future we'll be able to use. So there's also another end of it, the local support that I as impressed me in this series. But now we've got this question of legacies and we don't want to, I mean, you put the, the funding, the nasty question together with issue of legacies, which is something different. So we've got to hit that before we finish this question. And Ilya, you wanted to say something, didn't you? Yeah, I think as a, as a community, we can do much better in terms of understanding legacies or at least even acknowledging legacies. I think for many of our catchment studies, when we write in the journal, in the site description, we rarely say anything about what the land use was in the past, how it may have been influenced by people in the past. Um, and I think we have come as a community to some sort of standard script for a site description, as in it needs to say something about the climate, it needs to have the location, something about the typical slopes, the land use. And I think as a community, it would be really good if we start including having a little bit of history, what happened in the past, because most of our catchments aren't natural. Uh, there has been some influence by people or if probably all of them actually. Um, and I think having that information, even if it's just the awareness that things have happened in the past uh, for our current studies, maybe eventually this also will help us to understand better uh, the long-term impacts of changes. What are these long-term impacts of previous land use change? Um, and I'm sometimes really impressed, for example, by the ecologist where we talk about pristine rainforest and they say, well, yeah, but we have to be careful because, you know, we know that people lived here 50 years ago and had uh, agriculture because they had to flee into the forest because of this political uprising or something. And therefore, even the forest isn't pristine anymore. And I think we can do better in acknowledging that. You've got about six minutes left for this panel, including question time. 
So uh, <laughs> it's up to you how you would like to proceed. Let's move on to the last question. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, the fourth topic is research versus monitoring and data publications. And the specific questions we posed are, what are the unmet needs of the catchment science community for data management, archiving and publication? How do we incorporate data releases into existing high workloads? Do data publications come at the cost of reduced research and monitoring? And is this topic worthy of continuing examination? And if so, who would lead it? Great. I never thought I'd want to start on a question like this, but now I do after 30 years in the business. I spent the first half of my career working with the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, trying to build data portals, trying to push the data out. And about halfway through, the message came through, we don't want to see a portal. We want metadata. If you make that data available, we will find it when we need it. And when I saw this question about data publications, and you know, it's great that people want to get their data out there, but I wonder if it's a model that's out of date that now it's great when you publish an article, the data has got to be there. And so if somebody's looking for data, they'll find it in your research article. You don't, I'm not sure we need that data article. And especially if metadata is working in the way it should. And then the whole idea that we have these different types of articles of data, monitoring or research. To me, there should always be an idea that's behind an article, a reason you want to read it. And so I find these distinctions are not helpful. I mean, I want every, every article I read to have a message. And if it's just about the data is here, I think there'll be other ways to get that than to say, oh, here's my monitoring article, putting all the data there. If, if the data is there, there's something interesting and you'll publish that data when you're talking about something interesting and other people can come and find what they want in that data when they need it. That would be my contribution there. Um, so. But I'm not the only person here. Ilya, you had something you want to say about data. You were very yeah. positive about data publications. I, I do think data publications are really useful. I think the one thing that we shouldn't, especially as catchment scientists, but maybe it's also in other fields, uh, we shouldn't forget that it's probably all about the metadata. And there is so much um, data and knowledge and understanding that doesn't go in a, to a time series of discharge and precipitation. And I think there are tons of field observations that we never can put in a data publication. Um, and those are really important and, and, and necessary to, to build on uh, existing knowledge uh, about the place, uh, about processes, uh, maybe often it's one sample that we took or one observation when we were in the field uh, that changed our perceptual model of a place that changed the sketch of the catchment. Um, and that is usually not in the data that is archived. Um, one of the things that I think would be nice and interesting uh, as a follow-up of these catchments on how they work is for the long-term catchments also to have something, a publication that says, this is how we thought it worked in the beginning. Then we collected this one particular sample from this one well, and it turned out that it was completely different. Um, and I think that helps us to interpret data that is archived, why it was collected, uh, but also shows why continued uh, measurements and continued research in these long-term catchments is still valuable. Um, I think a good example of this is uh, the publication on the perceptual model of the Mai Mai catchment. Uh, there's a recent one out uh, for the Panola catchment. I think uh, if we had that for more catchments, that would be quite useful. And I just wanna echo everything that Ilya said, and she said it so eloquently. Um, I think that from, from the data perspective, um, data is, is, without the data, we wouldn't be here. And we need to respect the data and respect the people who collect the data. And I would also say that while painful, the pursuit of a standard operating protocol for collection of data would be oh so helpful. As someone who does a lot of intercatchment analysis and have touched space with many of you who are on this symposium, 
uh, the challenge of not having standard operating procedures to do that intersite comparison really hinders uh, the, the rate of scientific advances. But we have to value it and respect it and in, in whether it's co-authorship, whether it is uh, to the people who fund those who, who do that work, it's super important. But I really like uh, Ilya's comment about the more qualitative or the storytelling of these catchments. And you know, if we look at our field and the decades going on and many of us getting uh, long in the tooth and gray in the hair, uh, some of those things may be lost and it would be wonderful to have a blog or something about your experience of your, going back to Ross's digital forum, it could, it all, could also be about storytellings about different catchments and how it's changed over the time. And I'd love to be able to capture that before we lose it. So thanks for making that comment, Ilya. We're and back to you, Julia. I think we're done. Yep. We're at 30. Well done. <laughs> Great. Now we just go mute ourselves and turn off our cameras. <laughs> <clears throat> That's right. So was there any time for questions or we need to move right to the next panel, Julia? Well, the 30 minutes are up. Oh, okay, right. So we're on to the next, we're on to the early career panel. And this panel is Anna Bergstrom at Boise State, Jova Mosquera, who now has a new postdoc, you just informed me, at uh, San Francisco University in Quito, Ecuador. Elise Osengo from the uh, Aspen Global Change Institute. Jakob Steiner from a grad student, PhD student at University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, and Julia Suejo at the University of Padova in Italy. So um, they will have two of the same questions that the first panel addressed, and then two different ones to close it out. So Steve, you want to um, continue on with the introduction of the questions and topics? Sure, again, our first topic is, the forums, how do we move forward? So the questions, how do we preserve, sustain, and foster the community spirit in the international catchment science? Um, what tools can help support this? How can we better share information within the community? Do we need a forum for international catchment synthesis? And how or who would lead an effort to create and manage such a forum? With that panel, please chime in. Yeah, so um, uh, just to sort of summarize what uh, we were thinking and um, also uh, the previous panel brought up some really good points in that um, we think that both in-person and online opportunities are really important. Um, so online things like the seminar series has obviously proven to be really successful and they're really great for um, disseminating information, but also we need to continue to use some of those more um, quick conversational uh, ways of um, communicating online. So things like um, the about hydrology email lists and um, Slack channels and so on and so forth. Those seem like really good ways to communicate information and also allow for people like early career scientists to chime in a little bit easier and a little bit um, lower barrier of entry there. Um, <clears throat> so we also think that in person, something we agreed upon was that in person is really important, particularly for students and early career um, folks. And that's, you know, it gives people this experience of being part of the community. Um, and it also allows those um, students and early career folks to actually, you know, put their faces to their names. This is, these are places where you can meet more established folks and where you might actually um, stand out in a crowd. And when you're one of hundreds of people emailing about postdocs or PhD positions, um, you have actually developed connections, which are a little bit harder to do online. Um, so I know that we all, especially in the last year, have kind of gotten a lot of fatigue with these online forums and we've also seen, um, you know, tons of meetings pop up. So another theme that we kind of touched on was 
we need to sort of find the existing um, structures that work really well already and sort of um, put our effort towards those um, particular things. So continuing on stuff that's worked well, like this seminar series and um, uh, m some of the early panelists mentioned things like existing meetings and building on to those and emphasizing those um, so we don't uh, continue to have Zoom fatigue with yet uh, more meetings. Um, so we also wanted to um, uh, pose some sort of questions back to um, the other panelists and the audience. And that is, um, how do we continue um, online forums in the most effective way and keep people from getting overloaded, um, particularly for those early career folks who are still sort of working on developing those filters and saying no to things and realizing what's the best place to um, put their energy. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, how do we continue in-person events while increasing access for diverse and early career audience? So um, one of the concepts that came up with was this idea of slightly more specialized forums. So um, we can, you know, organize around topics um, that uh, allow people to have more of a voice in a smaller crowd. Um, and then also spreading the word, how can we um, communicate these opportunities to a broader audience and then create a welcoming space and allow voices to be heard. Um, you know, I've been in a number of in-person forums where it's like a tennis match of the later career folks and everyone else is just sitting there watching. So we need to find ways that we can um, allow uh, newer voices to, to speak out. And so I'd like to thank the organizers for creating an early career panel here. Um, and then the last thing is we need to provide funding to get a diverse audience there. Um, there's a lot of people who are limited in their ability to attend um, uh, these online forum, or sorry, in-person forums. And so we need to make sure that we devote resources towards bringing um, people to these spaces. So if anyone wants to add anything. You're at about four and a half minutes into this topic, just for your information. Yeah, I just very quickly wanted to add, uh, very briefly add to that, that I, I work in the, right now, I'm in Pakistan and I work in Nepal with uh, many early career scientists here who, you know, they never get a visa for AGU, uh, even the Nepalis don't, and they are very frustrated about that. So now in the, in the time of Zoom, I basically thought, well, great, now I can just tell them you can join any conference because it's all online. And they are understandably a bit reluctant as well because they say, no, 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 it's not that easy. You know, I actually want to go to San Francisco. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit, un it's not, uh, it's, uh, I, I also want to have that chance. So uh, just now that it's all online, it's easy for you to say, um, now we can join that. So even with those formats, they still stay away from it because they feel left out. So I think even in the time of online meetings, there is still a barrier we have to overcome in this case, so we're between the global north and south, that I don't know a solution for. And I think that will be a challenge for us in future because we need that diverse uh, community to make science better and to cover areas that we haven't covered so far, like we have seen on the map that is there that covers so much, but is still pretty patchy in some areas. Yeah, I, I would also like to add something to the forum uh, portion of the, of the question. So I find it that it can be uh, useful beyond the catchment synthesis. For example, now, as Jamie mentioned, I moved to a new university and I'm trying to implement a new experimental catchment. So uh, th there was the question before of keep monitoring the right things, but the question is what are the right things to monitor depending on where you are and what conditions you have in your catchment. So such a forum would be super useful if, uh, if you would be at an early career starting your, your monitoring setup. So uh, depending on, on your conditions, you describe them in, in a forum and then uh, the more experienced researchers can tell you go for these and that and then based on experiences. So we, we really think that this would be a very, very important uh, uh, resource for, for everyone in the community that the forum. Any other thoughts from the panelists on this first topic? We do, we're still getting some conversations in the chat. So I would encourage folks to keep their eyes there. Um, I think we'll, again, address some of these as we move through this panel. So I, I think we're in a position to move on to the next topic. And this next topic is the same one as the, the first uh, panel dealt with, and that's cross-site synthesis. 
So to remind you of those questions, what topics do you find most exciting for cross-site synthesis? What kind of synthesis is desirable? Conceptual that is inclusive of all sites, broad and broad but theme-based so that different sites can contribute what they have to it, or very focused and narrow topics. And then how do we choose and organize around synthesis topics and identify leaders with that panel? Yeah, so, so we discussed this and we really converged, I think, very quickly on uh, that for us, uh, the benefit of cross-site synthesis would be to, to test concepts um, that, you know, we, I, for example, I work in, a, in one catchment, you know, in high mountain Asia, I have some idea um, that uh, say, you know, can the cryosphere compensate for dry and wet conditions in a certain catchment. Uh, but I, if I can bounce that back off some, some other catchments with some other scientists somewhere else, um, then A, this would be super motivating for me uh, to, to keep going. Uh, but it may also prevent me from, you know, running down a wrong path or go, going down an, an avenue that may not be so smart. And that's why, you know, that's links to the first question. Uh, are forums important? Yes, they are, because now I know there are all these, you know, uh, currently 126 or 22 people plus the panel here that uh, many of them that I can, can check back with and can probably test some. I could test some of the ideas for concepts that I have in my catchment. Um, with others, the, the big question and the challenge here is, you know, is this an effort that is advisable to pursue? And this is perhaps the parallel in the modeling community is a bit these model intercomparison project, um, uh, projects. If you, if you ask the community, then half of, you know, is it smart to redo a model intercomparison project on, on some topic? Then half of the community says, uh, hallelujah, I already have enough gray hair. Uh, and the others say, yeah, super exciting because uh, so much, so much that can be get, gotten out of it. And uh, you know, uh, comparing concepts in different catchments can be a huge effort. Uh, but and that's perhaps also a bit of a question to the to the um, to the established uh, to the established scientists, catchment scientists here. Do you think that you know that's an avenue that's worthwhile going down, or are we just uh, uh, is it is it just uh, too gargantuan effort to 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 try to pursue? I and I think we 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 have discussed this. We think this would be exciting and would keep us you know driving forward and would keep us motivated in asking more questions if we can bounce off some of the concept ideas with with other people out there in perhaps completely different climatic settings, um, completely different infrastructure as well um, that has longer time series, of course, and these kinds of things. Yeah, but perhaps some of the other panelists also want to add something that I did not mention from our discussion. I might add just um, kind of an emphasis on something that you already said, which is when it comes to cross-site synthesis, these concepts that we picture organizing around, there needs to be a space both for really broad concepts um, of research, but also for just small um, kind of one-off questions and, and individualized opportunities to ask those questions so that as these concepts are developed, there's um, continuity between the ideas. Yeah, and sort of building off of what was brought up in the previous panel, that really wonderful idea of draw your catchment. That's a great way to sort of help us as a community identify these broad concepts that might cross different catchments. And so we can use that potential idea to organize um, within ourselves of what are these big concepts that are coming up um, across catchments? And then um, how can we then organize as a community to start um, interrogating those concepts across catchments? You're about uh, halfway through the time allocated, or you have about three, three and a half minutes left in this topic time window. Yeah, I, I would like to add something regarding on, on how to do this. So I find it a little bit difficult to do it online. Uh, that's our condition for now, right? But uh, hopefully it gets better soon. Um, but uh, I have a very good experience uh, from an AGU Chapman in eco tropical ecohydrology that was held in, in Ecuador a few years ago. And this conference is probably the best conference I have ever attended uh, because it, it had presentations in the morning, but all the afternoons were focused on um, uh, working groups to select popular topics or more, more interesting topics of general interest just to discuss about them. And then during these sessions to decide who would lead 
this is very important topics that we want to resolve as a community. So as part of this um, conference, there was a special issue on very different topics and, and they included conceptual and cross synthesis and, and, and so on. So I would say that that could be an option as well. And, and within our group, we also were talking about the, how the underrepresentation of some communities or some, I don't know, nationalities and the, the advantage of, of, of the AGU Chapman uh, uh, format at least is that it can be held anywhere in the world. So uh, yeah, more, more people from, from which normally have difficulties to come some, to, to some other place or in the US or something can, can join. So I would say that that could be an option to have a Leonardo conference also in, in, in Europe or, or something like that could be, could be helpful for this. Any other panelists would like to chime in on that? And one thing I can bring forward is that Jim McNamara wrote, what about synthesis and education too? Um, meaning that are there opportunities to create exercises that draw upon the lessons learned from multiple catchments in, in the classroom setting? And one example he gives, um, you know, spatial distribution of precipitation and mountain versus flatland catchments. Any of the panelists have any perspectives on that that they'd like to share? I think it would be great to have uh, education uh, synthesis on this topic. Well, um, also we discussed uh, a bit uh, uh, about the difficulty of uh, comparing uh, specific topics across the different catchments because, uh, of course, there are. We well know that there are some long-term measurements uh, in. Uh, um, well, lots of uh, catchments, but there are lots uh, of uh, small little catchments that were re that received uh, only recently some funding, so, or they are just uh, focusing on a specific uh, uh, processes. And then it's also for them uh, and for people that uh, do not have access to many funds uh, to cover uh, different uh, biogeochemical processes or studying different uh, Anyway, hydrological processes, it's uh, more difficult to find a synthesis uh, across uh, different catchments. And that is also hampered, of course, by the sampling design. And for the education tools, I think it would be great. And currently, I have not thought much about this, but uh, for sure, it would be a, a great idea also for synthesis. I would also like Jones, to... are we, where are we at with timing? Uh, it's um, 15 minutes in, we're halfway through the time. So a switch to topic three might be good at this point. Excellent. So we're gonna move on to a different topic than the uh, previous panel covered. And that's the question of, or, or the topic of the future of catchment science. And these are some of the questions that we pose to them. Apart from cross-site synthesis, what are promising future directions for catchment science? How should catchment studies adapt to emerging scientific and social issues? How important is it to maintain existing long-term measurements relative to a need to implement new approaches and measurements? And what are the lessons fr from new catchments and new studies that are, that are coming on board? Panelists. Okay, so we discussed uh, a lot about the future of catchment science and uh, all of us agreed that uh, um, it's great and we should maintain the long-term measurements. So if we have set up uh, an experimental catchment, it should be good to keep maintaining all the monitoring for as long as we can. But of course, this implies that uh, um, we have different, there are different funds issues, of course. And uh, mainly for, we experience that for many countries, uh, and for many different uh, uh, opportunities to get uh, funds, usually we uh, generally get funds if we are testing uh, new hypotheses. So if we bring a new theory on, on our catchments, and then uh, it's uh, likely we will get funds uh, to keep the monitoring. The problem is that, of course, uh, for many funding opportunities, opportunities, it's difficult to bring on what we are already doing. So, for example, if we kept doing uh, uh, tracer monitoring, uh, unless we have new theories, new uh, hypotheses to test, uh, it's uh, difficult to maintain uh, 
the measurements and uh, acquire new instruments or replace um, sensors and so on. We thought that, the, of course, uh, it's uh, great to, um, to keep up uh, with the new sensors and new platforms. So that's why we're talking about that uh, forums that could connect us better would be a new a good opportunity to share ideas uh, and to share um, our what we think about uh, uh, the development uh, on new chip sensors uh, and, and so on and to keep us updated of course and uh, we're also thinking about uh, that uh, still struggling about uh, um, the, how to get funds for our research it would be really important to, um, to adapt to this emerging scientific and social issue. Uh, so, for example, my country in Italy, so who also the, it's difficult for the pop local population to understand why we set up uh, small catchments to study specific hydrological processes rather than focusing on uh, learn more how about the transport of solids, transport of contaminants. Uh, and so some certain topics that are more important for the society rather than for us hydrologists or function theory. And uh, also another thing that we're discussing is, uh, okay, it's uh, still important to use different approaches um, to study, for example, uh, specific hydrological processes, but also to maintain uh, the long-term data set, for example, for hydrometric uh, levels uh, and weather data, because um, with this data, we're still able to identify extreme events uh, uh, that we, with a large return period and to keep track also the effects of the land use change and climate change uh, on the catchment hydrological behavior. And uh, the final question, what, uh, what was, um, was about the lessons that we learned from new catchments. Uh, and they were discussing, uh, uh, so uh, Jova was uh, saying that, uh, especially for in developing countries, uh, uh, it is quite complicated to get funds uh, for long-term monitoring. And so perhaps uh, for people that uh, do not have access to many funds, uh, it should be better to get the efforts uh, from different uh, multidisciplinary teams uh, and uh, uh, put our uh, force together and focus on uh, test the different uh, Mm, hypothesis uh, on one catchment as much as possible. I don't know if the other panelists want to add uh, something more. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll just add, sorry. <laughs> halfway through this topic. Okay, um, just to build on that a little bit, it seems like everyone, both the attendees and the panelists kind of agree of the value of long-term data and um, you know, it also seems like we um, know that as we continue to collect long-term data, new questions will come out of it. And so, like Julia said, um, you know, our funding is based on developing these new questions and new hypotheses and new ways to test them. Um, but it seems like we know that we can just rely sometimes on long-term data to develop new questions and test new hypotheses. And so really what we need to be doing is sort of doing a better job of communicating the importance to society and to our funding agencies to sort of change um, what they think is acceptable in terms of what to fund, including this long-term research, which we know is, is so valuable. So that communication, like came what came up in the earlier panel of these uh, gem data sets of importance, if we can get um, you know, the people who are providing us the funds to do this on board with, um, with that, that's, that's really what's gonna help drive long-term data collection forward. I also want, want to add something about the, this topic. So I think, uh, and, and we have talk, thought about data sharing, and I have to mention that in my in my former lab, uh, the, where, where there is a very nice experimental catchment, probably the best monitoring the in tropical alpine regions. Um, th there, there's a policy of not sharing data without part active participation of local researchers, because how this has worked is that uh, some researchers came, as, as Julia was mentioning, they uh, opened a department of water resources and then they set up experimental catchments all working at the same place. And then the main 
they, 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 they constructed weirs and then set up the monitoring network. So then with, with the, the funding of, of short term projects that you can replace sensors or anything, but can maintain the longer term. But also this, this, is, this was brought in, uh, through capacity building. So every time we collaborate with someone, we try uh, to participate actively in data analysis or anything so that the, the, the capacity stays at home. And then that has helped to have more questions or uh, to, to test or, 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 or idealize how to test more hypotheses and conserve the long term, which I think is really successful in this particular case. And that then brought to open hydrology master science program, our water resources doctoral program. And then this, this builds all over the catchment, right? But uh, then really always trying to bring new capacities to, to the lab. And I think that that might help some, some others. Any other thoughts from panelists on topic three, the future of catchment science? I think uh, it's a good time to transition. We have about seven minutes left in this half hour session. All right. So the fourth topic we asked this early career scientist panel to cover is diversity. So is catchment science more or less diverse than other disciplines? How do we increase diversity in the catchment sciences? Would the above question have a different answer um, in, in our field relative to other disciplines? And should we convene a group to promote diversity in catchment science? With that panel. Um, so as we were thinking about diversity, there were two kind of core um, concepts that we kept coming back to. So one is um, that there are lots of different ways of thinking about diversity, age, gender, um, race, economic background. And then the other kind of core concept that ended up being threaded throughout our discussion was the need for addressing um, barriers to diversity in catchment science and the sciences in general is something that will need to be addressed on all levels. So there are things early career folks can do, but there's also some really important things that can only be done by later career folks who are already in positions of power for things like distributing funding um, or deciding who to hire. So as we were talking about this, we kind of came to an organizing question as a way to think about it um, that went across those different groupings, which is what are some of the root barriers to participation in catchment science and where are there opportunities to address them? Um, and Gioba has a little bit more to share on that. Yeah, thanks Elise. So uh, while I was thinking about this diversity thing and I am I think I'm kind of an outlier here from people from the US and Europe. I started contacting some friends around the world and also my, my own community here in Ecuador. And I was thinking about how can we do to improve this as a community? And there are some things that we can do, but there are some others that it's, it's just not uh, our, it's just not in our hands. And, and one of them is language, for example. So I'm a not native English speaker and probably if my, my English wouldn't be decently enough to be here, I wouldn't be here. So we cannot change this. So hopefully countries itself can, developing countries can, can make this better. I don't know how I got here to this level of English to be here, but that, that's something that it's not in our hands, but it, it's definitely part of the lack of diversity, I think. The other one we have talked about a little already is funding for participation in international conferences. So, and that I have, I have had to experience uh, some bad moments, I guess. So sometimes I see this really cool conference or symposium or workshop, and then I want to apply for funds. And then it turns out that only uh, uh, citizens for certain country or region can apply. So that, that is something that, that, that we as a community could, could make a little bit better. So perhaps have funds uh, for, for, for foreigners from, from, re from different regions or so that, that, that we would like to participate. And one, one really, really important thing that I think it's related to what Jakob said uh, a little bit before with, with his Pakistani uh, colleagues is self-motivation. And what I mean by that, I was talking with a friend from Turkey and she told me that there, there's no hydrology programs there at all, but she's a hydrologist and she's very well recognized. And um, she was telling me, Joe, but there, there are no barriers or challenges there because we face many, many different challenges as women and as Latin American because of race or ethnicity or whatever. But uh, that is also part, I think, of why, why I'm here. I, I never gave up. And then I got self-motivated to get the funds whatever way I, way, way I can. And, and even sometimes I get disappointed, but I kept going. And just uh, when, when I listened to Jacob, uh, Jacob so I, I was thinking about like, if you really are interested in the knowledge and, and what you want to get from, from this kind of series, 
you wouldn't mind going or not to San Francisco or not, more, for example. So you really, so it so depends on what is your motivation for doing what you're doing. And that is something that perhaps as a community, if, if we have uh, students from um, developing countries in our programs or so, we can see they're motivated, we can just help them and, 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 and support the, their, their participation. I, I think that's very important. Uh, and, and yeah, that is more or less in, in that perhaps we can help. Uh, then the other thing about gender, more or less, I think I was talking yesterday with, with the head of my department in Ecuador, and there are not many women, it's true, in, in, in the department. And um, the thing is that the, 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 the undergrad program that, that, that mainly, uh, uh, I, I would say, contributes with, with human resources to the, to the master program in hydrology or the PhD program in water resources is civil engineering. And it was the same for my colleague in Turkey. Uh, so civil engineering is mostly known for having male uh, students. So probably that is an issue. So we need to start, uh, and I was thinking about forestry, maybe in the US as well. There are many hydro hydrologists who are, who are foresters or are foresters. So that, that's mainly uh, led by, by, by male scientists so, or, or male, male students. So that could be something that we, we need to start before our master's programs or our, our catchment science programs or anything. And the last one is, is it's a sad one, it's harassment, right? And then this conveys both uh, gender and also geographic uh, uh, regions. And uh, so uh, today uh, it was posted on, on the EGU blog, uh, uh, a post about harassment from, from a very, very uh, renowned um, female scientist. And I, 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 I reading through it, I was feeling the same, like coming from a developing country, maybe uh, I am not so sure that, that the research I'm doing is, is has the high levels to be here or so, and then participating in these meetings, I, I, I think so. I, 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 that uh, then this is an issue, and I think that, that there should be zero tolerance to harassment in, in any ways in many groups, and that, that would help, help diversity is, and is something we can do as a community. I just want to very quickly respond to what you said about motivation, that motivation should be the big driver, and I absolutely agree. I think that, but for that, we just need panels like the one here that show that shows people that with motivation, you can be there. And you are just, you know, I see here in the panel, in, in, the, in the attendees, there are many big names and, and great scientists that many people here in, in Asia as well would know from papers. And, uh, but, 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 you know, I am not, and I can, I can freely speak here. And if people from developing countries, they see events like this happening and they see that alone my motivation for the science and that, that, it, that it makes it possible for me to join this and also be able to talk and voice my opinion and ask questions, then it will be, it will be possible for them to, yeah, we can show them that, 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 that you know, you're, you're welcome as well. And that will lower one, one very important barrier, I think. That's why, yeah, get togethers like this quasi event can help a lot. We've reached the uh, 30 minute limit. Uh, we're about eight, nine minutes past 11. Stephen, how do you want to proceed? I think number one, just thank you to all of our panelists today and in the preceding seven weeks. Um, there's this perception that, you know, Jamie, Julia, Teresa, and I have done something here. And I think that's wrong. I think we, everyone, everyone in this community who's come together, whether for one or all eight of the weeks, eight of the weeks, we're, we're all together responsible for this and, and we're all responsible for pushing it forward too. So I, I think it's important to remember that um, we have, you know, riches of data, riches of knowledge and Beyond that, we have a rich richness in our community, and I think we should continue to build from this and move forward. Um, that, that's my take. I, I know it's not a good uh, direction for the last five minutes here. I'll let Jamie take over for that. But I just really do want to say thank you to everyone who's participated in any way, including the folks who are just watching the pre-recorded sessions or watching these recorded mm -hmm. sessions after they happen. We're, we're all part of this. Yeah, it has been a tremendous. Uh you know, <clears throat> contribution from so many people to make to make this a success. And we all really appreciate it. Um, you know, we only have a few minutes left. Obviously, we have a ton more things to talk about. And we haven't really converged on on the best way to move forward. So we'll be 
discussing that with you online in the coming weeks. And I hate to tell you, but there'll probably be another survey involved. But uh, you guys have been really good about completing surveys and giving us a lot of good ideas and direction. Um, so many great ideas came up here today. I really commend the panels for you know, organizing around these topics. I thank everyone for submitting the topics in the first place and taking a survey to tell which ones you wanted to hear about. And it was, I thought this was a great session. Um, I do want to give Teresa and um, Julia Jones a chance to, to say a few words here at the end. Uh, be, before that, I do want to mention uh, Julia Zueco, I'm just on the panel here now, is an editor on the EGU blog where you can post, uh, make a post about your catchment. So I'll be sending out her uh, information on that to everyone. So Julia, you can expect, you know, about a hundred uh, blog posts to edit soon. Um, but anyway, a few minutes left. So Julia, you want to say something at all? Let's have Teresa go first, please. Okay. Yeah, I would just like to mention again that we don't just have richness of data, but we also seem to have a very strong community spirit going on here, which you can see that we have more than 600 people registered for this series. So there's really, yeah, people want to be involved and people are excited about what we're doing uh, about our science. Um, and I think, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out a way how to keep this going if it's in, in sessions or uh, online forums. Um, also, I just want to let everybody know who's posted questions on the on the chat here that we are keeping a record of that. So your questions, even if they weren't discussed, they're not lost or your comments. So um, we might get back to those and get in touch um, uh, as we're moving forward. And again, thank you to everybody for participating. Thanks. Yes, I echo, I echo this. Uh, it, it is so incredibly heartening to see the amazing ideas and all the energy and also the potential for more exchange among uh, people in different parts of the world at different career stages and from very different backgrounds. And I really look forward to continuing to discuss with you all and formulate some um, multiple new activities and engage many of you who have great leadership potential to help lead us forward. So thank you all. And thanks to Stephen and Jamie and Teresa for getting us started on this and to Julia Masterman for a masterful mm -hmm. conduct of this whole series. Yeah. Let's give a big hand for Julia hey, Masterman. Take a bow, please. <laughs> And, uh... Yes, thank you everyone um, for this incredible <laughs> series. It has been a joy to work with all of you. Um, <laughs> Many of you suggested we keep this going. Maybe we will in some form. But thanks everyone. Thanks again. And um, you'll be hearing more soon. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>